Is there anyone out there that wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror, and says to themselves, Okay, I am, insert color here, so let me go and schedule my day around whatever I can do to be that color, i.e. dress, food, friends, etc. All while I notice every other color around me and act accordingly. To me, that would seem a little bit, I don't know, but it rhymes with podiatrist. <laughs> Every day I see more and more people in the media, politics, academia, pointing out people's skin color, religion, and other things like political affiliation. Those seeming to be the most prevalent of my observations so far and being judgmental about those things rather than seeing a person's actions or judging a person's actions like as if they were saving a person's life or even the opposite. What difference does this make? To me, none. It actually confuses me a bit because I was born about 10 years after the Civil Rights Act when they dissolved the Jim Crow laws and stuff like that. So I've always gone to school, worked with, gone to recreational event, events, lived by, and even gone to church and the beach, played music, and fraternized with every race, creed, color, religion, and orientation, if you will, without incident and without noticing what color or religion they all were, and vice versa. All my life, in fact. Anyone else born after 1960 has pretty much done the same as far as I know. Usually when that kind of thing was noticed, if ever, it turned into a joke or it was done in good humor or a lot of times it was done or asked to learn about one another. No one was ever disparaged about their personal trials and tribulations. Now, not being able to hold your liquor, on the other hand, was something different. But none of my friends ever fought about their skin color, religion, or even political beliefs, or ended friendships over those things either. Not that I ever knew of anyway. Now that I'm in my 50s, I'm being told by every media outlet, professor, and politician that not only are people judging me by the color of my skin and who I worship and vote for, but they're trying to convince me that I should be doing the same to everyone else. Guess what? I refuse. In my honest opinion, there are good and bad in any person, regardless of their skin color, their religion, their orientation, their ethnicity, and of course, in my opinion, there's never going to be any kind of unity or progress, especially in our country, being and feeling this way towards others, or yourself for that matter. This kind of attitude is definitely taught, and this attitude was wrong before the Civil Rights Act, and it is equally as wrong now, no matter who this way of thinking comes from. Now, recently I came across an article from the BBC that explains a study on impact of these lockdowns that we've been going through on prejudice. First, just let me say that I believe articles like this are partly responsible for some of these attitudes that we're witnessing today. Let's read. BBC News. Working from home could lead to more prejudice, report warns. Now, my very first problem with this headline is that it's, it's, it's ambiguous. Using words like might, could, may, perhaps connotate an assumption. My arm could fall off while I'm trying to write my script for this video, but we both know it's not going to. This is basically what I hear when I hear the word could or may or might in a declarative sentence or headline. I don't really have any hard evidence of this claim, 
but I'm going to put it in your head anyway so you can eventually convince yourself that what you have just read is true. Then as we read further, here is some inconclusive evidence and other people's opinions to help you along your way with your conclusion, which is supposed to be like mine. How trusting have we become of some of these authorities or experts, huh? Now, from what I've read, this article seems to be concentrating on the differences, supposed preferences uh, among and between different religions in the UK. BBC, of course. We'll keep reading. Widespread working from home could lead to an increase in racism and prejudice, a new report warns. Of course, they don't cover too much racism in this one. It's mostly, it does cover mostly uh, religion, it seems. Workplace friendships are key to breaking down misconceptions. The England and Wales study for the Wolf Institute suggests. Suggests. Institute founder Ed Kessler said as more people work from home, they risk going back into isolated silos. Well, now whose fault is that? He called on ministers to focus on offices and workplaces as a vital area for improving community relations. The study conducted by polling company Servation for the Wolf Institute, which researches interfaith relations, surveyed 11,701 people. 11,701. That's actually only not even 1% of the population of Wales by itself. So, how accurate could this possibly be? Then they go on to tell this touching little story, which is great. Understanding each other. Hadaya Masih, who is Muslim, became close friends with Samuel Rosengard, an Orthodox Jew, after working together. Well, that's nice. <laughs> I, I, it's better than them fighting all the time, I would imagine. Samuel said that while he had never had racist or Islamophobic views in the past, he may have had misconceptions about Muslim communities. Okay, so he's saying he was never racist or homophobic. Were they claiming he was to begin with? Or does his misconceptions actually connotate that anyway? Is this what they're trying to tell us? Anyway, he goes on, meeting Hadaya has really helped clarify where my thinking can be askew, he said. Hadaya agreed that for her, it was more of a political thing about Israel and Palestine. Of course it was. But through their work, they have become close friends. Well, that's great. Wonderful. I, would, I like people getting along. <laughs> that's, that's the best thing. It was just a very natural relationship that we formed because we had the same agenda and passions, Hadaya said. We were both from very different backgrounds, and the idea of Israel and Palestine was a hot topic. But we were able to discuss that in a way that was understanding of each other. Yeah, you don't really want to argue too much when you're working. I mean, you've got a job to do. The other stuff is probably not... Uh, it has no bearing. It really has no bearing unless you make it have a bearing, which it sounds to me like one of the folks wasn't think about anything other than getting to work and doing what he had to do. The other one, she was very political about it, but she decided that she was going to be friends with him. Great. It's better than the alternative, I say. Samuel added, before COVID, we could have regular discussions about these kinds of issues and also identifying common cultural traits between Jewish and Muslim communities and areas of agreement and disagreement. Hadaya and I would often start off conversations just bumping into each other in the open plan office and then head off for a coffee. But that just doesn't happen, so that is a loss. Well, there's always Skype. If you guys are that good of friends, do you not see each other in uh, any of the um, many Zoom calls that have been going on for the last eight months? I'll read on. It goes back to the study from here. The study suggests that one of those that of those who work in shared offices, three quarters, seventy-six percent, 
regardless of ethnicity, we're in a setting that is ethnic, ethnically diverse. Well, I think that's true in just about any big city nowadays. Uh, I know it has been for everywhere that I've ever lived, including uh, some of the small towns. So, However, it suggests that unemployed people are 37% more likely to only have friends from their own ethnic group. Now, when you get to the meat of this matter, I'm going to reiterate the ambiguity of this article with regard to what they're trying to portray here. Basically, what they just said, this, this sentence, this last paragraph said, it only suggests. It doesn't clarify or prove anything. So why even have a study like this if you aren't trying to conclude anything? I mean, what a waste. And what exactly are they trying to convince us of here? Then when you have information or facts about 76% of something, and it makes you automatically assume the exact opposite of the 37% without doing any research on them, I, I, what they really think or anything like that. So, you know, in the words of the great late Frank Zappa, great googly moogly man, if this is how they actually conduct any kind of scientific anything these days, then it's no wonder that the world is burning. I mean, but don't get me distracted. I'll continue reading. And it warns that without alternative settings to offices being set up, opportunities for social mixing between different religions and ethnic groups will be greatly reduced. I suppose they don't have parks or amusement parks or restaurants or bars or anything else. No nothing else is open. They have to depend solely on their workplaces for this. The study also examined people's opinions on diversity. Okay, so again, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this information that they're giving us now from this point on seems that like it's antidotal, perhaps. This is yet another reason to think that this study wasn't to actually prove anything it says. It was a survey of over 11,000 people, and based on a lot of its suggestions, people's opinions as well. And think about this. Being that for at least the last 20 years or so, give or take, up to this point, the media and other such establishments have made diversity, as they call it, into such a touchy uh, such a touchy topic. How many people do you think were totally honest about all of this, especially in the UK nowadays? Besides that, when did the workplace and work environment become a place for opinions and and community service? Unless it's actually that kind of a business. Uh, when did they start making the workers people's relevant in this kind of situation? Like, don't you folks have work to do? I mean, I was never asked for my opinion when I worked anywhere about anything. Uh, I had a job to do. I did it. And I got my little money and I went home. Even when I was an office manager, all they wanted from me were my numbers and my compliance to office procedures. There were no opinions. I, I got to tell you, office and work settings sure seem very different from when I was working in the corporate setting. But again, don't get me distracted. I'll read on. Its findings suggest that while nearly three quarters of non-black or non-Asian respondents were comfortable with a close relative marrying a black or Asian person, 74 and 70 percent respectively, less than half, 44 percent, said they were comfortable with the idea of a close relative marrying a Muslim person. The word Muslim appears to trigger more negative sentiment than the word Pakistani, the report says. This is despite the fact that 90% of people of British Pakistani heritage are Muslim. Now, I have my own conclusions based on recent history as to why this might be. Notice I use the word might, mainly because I haven't done any studies or anything on this. 
But this is a subject for another video and another time, probably on another channel. And if you know anything about the UK, especially London right now, you will be able to come to your own conclusions on this. The report also indicates that a majority of Muslims were themselves uncomfortable with a close relative marrying a Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, or Sikh person, or someone of no religion. Around a third of Muslim respondents, about 38%, said they were uncomfortable with a close relative marrying a Christian person. Muslims were both the primary target for uncomfortable responses, but also the primary source. You think this might be one of the reasons for the above stats with people not being comfortable with close relatives marrying Muslims? People do have a tendency to not like people that don't like them. Let's read on. The study estimated the level of prejudice in each local authority across England and Wales. Researchers used a technique known as multi-level regression post-stratification. Boy, if that doesn't sound Orwellian. Which looks at the survey responses and the Democrats of each area. And, of course, they're trying to prove that there's a greater, uh, pre greater prejudice towards Muslims. Percentage who would be comfortable with a close friend or relative marrying someone from one of the following groups. And you can see the chart here. Black, 90 to 100 percent. Or 80 to 89 percent. It looks pretty cut and dry there. The Asians, they don't have, they have 80 to 89 percent, 70 to 79 percent, depending on where they are. But Muslim, all the way down to 40 to 49%. Predict, predicted results from MRP and analysis of survey responses. Some estimates for local authorities contain wide margins of error. So they're saying even this isn't proper. Again, how many people do you think were extremely or totally honest with these survey questions, especially as touchy of a subject as diversity is these days? As well as being the most common target of negative attitudes by other faith groups, the report indicates Muslims are the group most likely to hold negative attitudes towards people of other religions. Once again, uh, that's human nature, it sounds like to me. Um, I know that uh, when I know someone doesn't like me, I don't, I don't go out of my way to be by them. It's not that I don't like them, but if they don't like me, what are they going to be capable of? Workplace and friendship diversity var varies. Percentage of people who are more likely to have British colleagues or friends compared to London. Now, this is kind of sort of strange. Uh, basically, they're comparing an international metropolitan city that, of course, is going to be as diverse as they come from everyone around the world, and that includes, that includes a lot of metropolitan cities here in the United States as well, but they're comparing, it's like comparing New York City to upstate New York, basically. Of course the demographics are going to be different. Of course the way people do things are going to be different. Of course the workshop relationships are going to be different. you got people farming and doing manual labor in some of these places, whereas in the cities you've got people working in offices. And, and and not doing manual labor, unless, of course, they're the janitors or the whatever they call them, custodials, and, of course, your first responders and whatnot. But even that's different than what you see in the country. Believe me, as a city dweller or a someone that was born in the city originally and has finally migrated to the country, it is like night and day. Personal relationships included. The study also suggests that diversity of friendships and colleagues vary significantly around the country. Well, duh! Even after accounting for factors such as age, educational attainment, 
and ethnic makeup of an area, people in a northeastern England are 150% more likely to have only British friends and 68% more likely to have only British colleagues compared to the people in London. Like I said, it's like comparing New York to upstate New York. Have you been to New York City? New York City is the concrete jungle. People live on top of each other. They relate to each other in way different ways. They work together in way different ways. They have more diversity. It's a, a metropolitan hub, international metropolitan hub. As we're upstate New York, you're not gonna find that many. You're gonna find the people that were born there. They, they say the statistics show that most people don't leave within 50 miles of where they're born. I'm one of the few that have done that. I have been around the world. I'm also a military brat. So, so yes, of course, the city's going to be way different than the country. The city's even going to be way different than the suburbs. Even though some people in the suburbs actually work in the cities. In fact, I lived in the suburbs and worked in the cities and I couldn't wait to get out of the cities. I was never, I was never anybody that really wanted to party with my workmates anyway. I got there. I went there to do a job. I wasn't there to make friends. Not to mention the fact that people will backstab you. Less positivity towards religious diversity. Percentage who agree or disagree that the following are good for British society. Ethnic diversity, 53%. Agree, strongly agree. 27% don't care. 18% disagree strongly or disagree. And three, don't know. Migrants, 40% agree strongly or agree. 30% don't care. 21% disagree strongly or disagree. And 3% don't know. Religious diversity, 41% agree strongly. 31% don't care. 23% disagree strongly or disagree. And 7% don't know. I wonder if that means they don't care too. Who knows? Results from representative sample of 11,701 adults across England and Wales. Source, Servation on behalf of the Wolf Institute. I'll, I'll explain Servation in a minute. The report says any apparent prejudice towards religion could be due to people feeling it is more acceptable to express negative sentiment towards religion than ethnicity. And who told them that it was more acceptable? Is it the questions that they're asking these people? Notice they don't ever tell you what they ask these folks. Religion remains a place where individuals are willing to express negative attitudes, the report says. Being Muslim, in particular, appears to remain a trigger for prejudice, making religion a final frontier for prejudice in England and Wales. The report's author, Dr. Julian Hargreaves, added... So, now, this is their methodology. This is how they came to this conclusion, if you will, which actually, to be honest with you, this, it's, it's the same conclusion all the time. Everyone's prejudiced against the Muslims. I don't see that. I'm not seeing that. Why do they keep trying to convince people of that? The survey was undertaken by Servation on behalf of the Wolf Institute. Servation spoke to a nationally representative sample of 11,701 adults across England and Wales between the March 29th and April 5th of 2019. So this was actually done before COVID even came around? <sighs> the results indicating the proportion of people in each local authority who would be happy with a friend or close relative marrying someone from various backgrounds use a technique called multi-level regression post-gratification, MRP. MRP projects the results of the survey onto local authorities based on the demography of the area. However, some estimates contain wide margins of error and statistically non-significant differences between local authorities. So, again, this article sounds like it's trying to convince you of something that it doesn't know itself, or it hasn't bothered to prove itself. What a waste, in my opinion. And they still didn't prove anything to me. 
Now, I'm going to show you who Servation is. I'm not going to go too much farther with this because, uh, again, this would become a feature film or a documentary, and we don't want that. <laughs> so, Servation, who are we? Engaging in a, a opinion to inform the future. Servation provide vital insights for brands and organizations wanting to better understand authentic opinion, adding value and credibility to the research we provide to our clients. We are an innovative and creative market researcher and do not believe any single method can always be the right answer to complex client objectives. So basically they do telephone research, omnibus surveys, face-to-face -face research, advanced statistical modeling, qualita qualitative research, and data analysis. Also bespoke online. Um, they basically are the people that you would see in the malls or you used to see in the malls that would say, hey, come and, come and test this out for us and tell us what you think so that they could give the feedback to the company, whether or not they were going to make money on it or not. In fact, a lot of companies spend millions and millions of dollars on research alone. That's why some products are extremely expensive. So, and this is what an MRP is. This is what they did. The multi-level regression and post-stratification MRP is a way of producing estimates of opinion and attitudes for small defined geographic areas. It works by combining information from large national samples, for example, tens of thousands of respondents, with ONS and census data. The MRP regression part, multi-level regression part. The responses given by respondents are modeled on the basis of their demographic characteristics and what we know about their area. It's past voting history, how it voted in the EU referendum, and so on. This is the multi-level regression part. That actually sounds ominous. For example, a 23-year-old female living in London who works in the media sector who, and has a university education has a higher probability of being a Remain voter than a 72-year-old male living in Grimsby who is retired former fisherman that left school at 16. So they've already prejudged these people uh, based on where they live and uh, wh what areas showed what voting anyway. The post-stratification part. In s the subsequent post-stratification stage, we use census data to calculate how many people of each demographic live di type live in each area and combine this with additional relevant contextual information to predict how many of these people will vote for each party or have a certain opinion. In this way, the estimates, although they are derived from a national sample, end up being representative of the demographic makeup of each constituency. The MRP technique f allows us to model based on demographic characteristics and areas attitude on almost anything from immigration to consumer behaviors. So the technique will not only assess the likelihood of an individual with a particular set of value va variables having a specific opinion but also map out how differently individuals with different opinions or behaviors are distributed across the country. Once again, that might be the way that they do it, but I still have my doubts as to how many people actually tell them the truth unless they're asking about their friends. Tim Pool has mentioned on several occasions that they're finding out that when they do polls of things, they actually, instead of asking that person what they would think because they're more likely to lie, they'll ask what that person's friend is going to do. Now, if you watch some of the same folks as I do, then you were actually recently made aware of a very... the word that rhymes with podiatrist type of video from a channel called Cut, where they asked, I believe, a hundred uh, black folks, F. O-L-X, as they put it. Not real sure what they mean by that there. Actually, I used to use it. I used to use an X for the K-S sound because it actually is kind of the same. Uh, and, of course, I was in the music business, so titles and things like that were always kind of uh, ironic, if you will, I guess. What exactly, this is what they asked them, what exactly are white people supreme at? 
Why is this even a question? By the way, wonderful grammar, huh? The answers were a bevy of BS, in my opinion, uh, and represents to me just another of the learning devices that are being used to convince and teach that skin color is and should be a factor in people's judgment of others and even yourself. Unfortunately, anyone that answered anything but the following actually believes that whites are supreme, which is real sad because that seems to be literally what is holding some of them back. They're very capable and talented folks, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, most people are. And uh, they're backed into believing that they can't progress when literally living in the United States, nobody can stop them, especially if they live in the United States. What exactly are white people superior at? White people are not superior uh, with anything. Nothing. 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 There is nothing. <laughs> nothing. I don't believe that they're superior in any way, shape, or form. Just because our skin color is different, you're no better than me. You're no smarter than me. No. No superiority there. If you'd like to watch the rest of that video, I've linked it below, but let me warn you, if you know anything about history or even believe in equality at all, even a little bit, you won't like what you see until the end. I'm going to let Jericho Green tell you what I've known all along and what I was taught from the beginning of my life. You don't give a f what your skin color is. The only color that really matters is green. That, and every person has as much right to be here, take up space, and have freedom, as I do, as you do. It's what God intended, and it's supposed to be the American way. But, only if we stop looking in our mirrors in the morning and saying, what color am I today, and how am I going to act accordingly? But none of us do that now, do we? I hope you enjoyed my video today. If you'd like to support my work and my eventual growth into a live call-in talk show, please share this video. I would also accept a like, a comment, a subscription, and a donation would be the ultimate. Still trying to feed the kitty. I also have a P.O. box in case you want to send me something and are not on PayPal. Don't forget to smash that notification bell so that you don't miss any of my videos or shows. All of my links are in the description below, and thank you in advance. Thank you for clicking on my little acre of the internet today. Until next time.